There we go. And uh, switch to my hotspot real quick. I just got a warning that my Wi-Fi was unstable. Oh, it's windy. My wi now I'm on my hotspot, so I should be okay. Okay, fantastic. It is recording now. <laughs> oh. Hi everyone. I'm Cecilia, and I would like to talk to you about graves. Um, so making clothes from the Viking age can be a little tricksy because there are no clothes from the Viking age. And there's not great art from the Viking age that really clearly shows you clothes from the Viking age. Um, you know, I started off doing later period in 14th century and there's loads of information about that. There's like 700 mazillion illuminations that I can look at to see what a 14th century dress is supposed to look like. That is not the case for um, the Scandinavian Viking Age. So what are you gonna do? <laughs> you're gonna do your best and you're gonna look at graves and you're gonna extrapolate from there. Um, quickly, this class is not, I'm not gonna talk about jewelry. I'm not gonna talk about beads. I'm not gonna talk about shoes. I'm not gonna talk about socks. Uh, I'm probably not gonna talk a lot about textiles really other than plant and uh, animal. Um, not really gonna talk about colors and dyes and stuff just cause there's, I don't know how much time I'll have cause I've never taught this class before. So we'll see how long it goes. Um, those are all things that if you have questions about them we can talk about at the end cause I'm happy to talk about them but they're not within the purview of my handy schmancy PowerPoint, which I'm going to share now. Am I? I am. Momentarily, everyone should see a picture of a dead person. Is that, you guys see my PowerPoint? Good. Yeah, we do. Yep. Norse women's clothing and the graves that made them. Thought that was clever. This fantastic picture is from a group it's got a German name or some language that I can't pronounce. Um, Andromers, Hermitig, I don't know. Um, I got this picture from their Twitter feed. It was going all around social media a couple of years ago. You can look it up. There are four images from this series, two women and two men. And what a cool picture, right? Ah, uh, grave finds. Gosh, so good. So the nice thing about the Scandinavians is that they buried dead people with all of their stuff. And that helps up to a point with regards to uh, clothing reconstruction. Um, in the environment of Scandinavia, clothes, textiles don't preserve super well, but if they're touching metal, then the, um, the chemicals from the metal leach into the fibers and, and preserve them. And so in places where metal is in contact with fibers, you get fibers. And that's a lot of what we know about Norse clothing. So thank you, Norse people, for burying yourselves with all of these metal items. It's very convenient for us. By the way, that link down at the bottom, the Google Drive one, is this PowerPoint. I have it on a Google Drive and I will put it in a while. I will put it in the chat. I'll do it at the end. Um, in case you're interested in it. And then I will also post on the event Facebook page with the link. Um, I did not get this done in a timely manner, so I wasn't able to post it anywhere official. I finished it last night. Sorry about that. All right, are we gonna move forward? What are we doing? Sorry. Apparently I'm not going to, what is my computer doing? It's not. Apologize for my technical difficulties. I don't know why it will either. Well, this is embarrassing. Okay. It's not letting me. I need some technical assistance. I don't know how to get it to move forward. Are you in PowerPoint or are you on Mac? I'm in key book, Keynote, but my cursor's gone. So it's not letting me stop sharing and it's also not letting me move forward. Are you using a touchpad or a mouse? I'm using a touchpad. 
there should be a button somewhere uh, near the numbers or the function keys that turns your touchpad on and off. And if you've accidentally hit it, it's something like F6 on most of them, somewhere in the middle. Uh, your mouse will quit paying attention. I've never had this happen before, and I don't, I don't have any F keys. No, it's hmm. at the back. So um, can you press escape? It did, and it got me. Ah, oh, this is terrible. Oh, never mind. I fixed it. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how. We'll see if it does something. Anyway, uh, for the purposes of our discussion, I'm talking about Scandinavia, which is Norway, Sweden, not Gotland. So that's the little island off of Scandi uh, off of Sweden, and it's got its own weird situation with like peploses and stuff. We're not going to talk about that. Iceland and Denmark. Um, it does not include Finland. It does not include the British Isles, although there's a huge amount of similarity, but there's definitely distinctions between Scandinavian clothing and accessories and jewelry and whatever and the British Isles. So there's, we'll talk about them a little bit, but not a ton. Um, the Baltic countries, not Scandinavia. The Rus countries, not Scandinavia. They are interacting a great deal during the Viking Age, but they are not, um, they're unlikely to be wearing the same thing. So I'm not in, gonna be including um, any contemporary grave finds from anywhere other than Scandinavia with a couple of little exceptions when we get to the end to headwear. So this is a fancy map that shows that. This is just a list, by the way, there's a lot of stuff on these slides. This just lists of graves and lists of little things from graves. I'm not gonna go over all of it because that would be excruciatingly boring and nobody cares about that. This PowerPoint, I will make available to you. So if you wanna look at it yourselves, then you can read all of that um, in its minutia. Um, additionally, I would like to disclose that a very significant portion of this information comes from Hilda Thunem's research which I have linked at the end of this presentation. She is um, she has a number of articles that are very academic where she's gone through a lot of the archeological sources that are not in English um, from you know, the last century or so of work on these graves. Um, and they're fantastic articles and I highly recommend them. And a lot of this information is from, from that source. So FYI. So if you're interested in graves, here's some graves. Um, there's a bunch of good ones in Norway, um, one of which, uh, Skjoldum is right squeaking in the end of the Viking Age, if you kind of squint at it, and there's some problems, I think, with Skjoldum as well, but, um, it does have some pretty significant garments, um, much more entire and intact than other graves, so people really like to use it particularly for hoods, um, we can talk about that later. Sweden, the biggest site that you're going to see referenced is Birka. And of course, that's because they have huge graveyards and like 200 years worth of good stuff. A lot of textile finds from Birka. Um, Birka has got its own issues, largely because it was such a trade hub with the Slavic empires. And so there's some, there's a little bit of interpretation, I think, that needs to be done with some of those grave finds. Um, we're not going to talk a ton about Iceland just because I haven't gotten there yet. <laughs> so I don't, I don't have a lot of information for you on that. Um, and then we love Denmark because Denmark is where Hedebu is. Um, and there's a lot of really good textile finds from there as well. Um, my favorite grave is Osberg. I'm not going to talk about it a ton because the textile evidence there that is clothing is a little sketchy, um, which I will also get to later. Norway's got some pretty good um, peripheral finds though, like little tiny weird graves um, along the west coast um, that you know might have like a little fragment here and a little fragment there, but when they're, you take them all together, since they're all from the same country, you can kind of squint and say it's good. So we'll talk about those as we go on. One other quick note is that most of these graves are described as male or female based primarily on what's in the graves. I think there's starting to be more and more um, uh, analysis of the bones to actually identify who's what gender. But a lot of the early identifications were like, oh, there's an ax, I guess it's a man. <laughs> and 
oh, there's some weaving equipment. I guess it's a woman. Um, or largely there's turtle brooches, so it must be a woman. Um, but just do be aware that the sort of um, gender assignments of these graves is, is largely based on accessories and not on like DNA evidence. There's some that are DNA, but they're getting closer to that. All right, so to start the meat of, of this class, when you want to reconstruct Viking age clothing, you've got to, I think, be a little honest with yourself about what is actually available to base your reconstruction on. I think for a lot of people in the SCA, this doesn't really matter that much. Like you make a pretty apron dress that looks like what somebody else wore that you thought was really pretty and it's good. And that's fine. Like if that's what you want to do, feel free. I copy other reenactors all the time. It's, it's fine. Um, if your goal is to move towards a more historical silhouette, well, then you've got to start to ask yourself some harder questions, not what colors do I like or what, um, you know, do I want to make my Viking dress heraldic, which sure <laughs> if you really want to do that that's fine um but you've got to think a little bit more about the context of these garments and what we actually know and what's sort of become anthropological folklore certainly what's become sca folklore um there are a lot of things that are common practice in sca viking age clothing that i've never seen referenced in a grave um but we do it because we've seen it all the time. I mean, it's like when I started in the essay 25 years ago, I was told that pink wasn't period. We all know better than that. That's foolishness. Um, so there are a lot of things that are sort of common practice in the SDA that are not particularly based on archaeology. So when you're doing your reconstruction, when you're planning it, I think you, you have to sort of decide what your goals are. And if your goal is to make a pretty dress, then make a pretty dress. You don't need to be constrained by what you can find in a grave and what you can't just be honest about it like make a pretty dress no one's gonna yell at you or shake a finger in your general direction um unless you say to someone look at this beautiful heraldic viking apron with a giant applique i don't know sunflower on it or something it's probably not historical um so just you know if that's not your goal then don't worry about it but if your goal is to be historical then you've got to go a little bit further so because there's not a ton of evidence, certainly not whole garments for this era, you've got to sort of decide how slavish you want to be to what is available. So if you want to just base your reconstruction on graves, that's going to be tough because there's no actual dresses for you to base it off of. Um, there's little pieces of dresses, like little pieces of dresses. Um, so you've got to then fill in those blanks with some inferences and you can use um, other contemporary cultures. I mean, people, people reference the Rus all the time. Um, people reference Gotland, people reference the, the Finns. Um, those are probably not the best ones to use. If you really wanna use other referential cultures, I would suggest the Anglo-Saxons, the Franks, um, the Carolingians. They're at least kind of in the, European zone. Um, and it's, there's less, I think, cultural division in those cultures than there would be necessarily between the Scandinavians and the Slavs. And that's per personal opinion. I'm sure you can make an argument either direction. Um, the nice thing about the Franks and the Carolingians is that they did have art and they had art from the 10th century. So you can look at a painting in a book, you know, that depicts someone's neckline or the length of their tunic or something. And you say, all right, well, sure. <laughs> I can sort of assume that, you know, if these two countries are connected, you know, Germany is connected to Denmark, maybe that's um, something that you can use to fill in information. Um, you can use references that people writing about Viking Age Scandinavians are saying about their accessories, their color palette, stuff like that. Um, and you can also use later um, garments because there are later, there are full garments from slightly after and slightly before 
the Viking age. So you can sort of use those as bookends and say, well, if it, the tunic looks like this in the Anglo-Saxons and the tunic looks like this in Skildum or Mosland or whatever bog you're looking at, there's a really good chance that it looked the same in that intervening period. So you just wanna be kind of aware of what assumptions you're making and why you're making those assumptions. So any questions about that? It's sort of an awkward topic, right? Because you can't just say, I'm gonna make that dress from that Viking person because there isn't a Viking person that has a dress that I can use. Like here's this tiny little figurine that's this tall and I'm gonna <laughs> make a dress based on that. Okay, so the elements that we're gonna mainly talk today are tunics, whether that's an under tunic or layer tunics or whatever. We're gonna talk about the apron dress, which is in quotation marks because that's an awkward term. We're gonna talk about warm layers, shawls, caftans, whatever. Um, we're gonna talk a tiny bit about headwear. I don't know who this woman is in this picture, but I liked this outfit and I wanted to use it. I love the colors, right, that blue, super um, ubiquitous dye imported probably from um, the continent, either woad or indigo gives you a beautiful blue on wool and linen. And so there's evidence of blue dyed linen underdresses, which is a kind of a big deal. Um, this orangey color on her apron dress, you can get from matter. Um, you can get it from um, yellow X which is an unidentified yellow dye from the era. Maybe it's onion skins. That's my personal um, guess. It could be broom. There's a, a handful of plants that grow native in particularly Southern Sweden that produce a nice yellowy, goldeny color. I love her little shawl and how it's connected to her brooches. I don't love the plaid. That's another topic. Um, there's no big plaids. Um, engraves from the Viking age. There are little teeny tiny ones and there are big plaids from earlier than the Viking age. So you can say, well, if they're making big plaids in Huldermos or whatever, why wouldn't they be wearing a Nosberg? But we don't have evidence of that. So you've got to make a decision about how you want to interpret your data. Um, I also really like that she's only got the one strand of beads plus the necklace. Um, we in the SDA love our giant festoons and those aren't really defensible from graves. The number of beads are a little bit excessive. I think the average number of beads in a Viking age grave is the big ones at least are like 10 to 12. And that's in rich people's graves. There's a couple of exceptions to that. There's a grave in Birka that's got a hundred plus big beads. Apparently there's seed beads galore that were never conserved because no one cared about them. Um, I also love her little hat. That's a little Dublin cap, super cute. She's got a little bit of a postament here on the top. She's got a blue um, silk band at the top of her apron dress that I really like. It's really simple. There's direct evidence for that. It's kind of nice. Okay, we good? Move on. Cirques. All right, I'm gonna use the term cirque for the underdress. Honestly, I think that's Norwegian for underdress. I, I mean, a lot of these terms that we think of as being like the name for things, it's just the Norwegian word for, or the Swedish word for underdress or whatever. Um, please don't get hung up on vocabulary for this era. There's not written evidence. I mean, we don't have some yeoman from ninth century uh, Norwegian or Norway talking about the garment that his wife was wearing. Like we don't, we don't know what these things were called. Um, so use a word that other people understand and it's fine. Don't, don't get hung on that, up on that too much. Probably underdresses or linen. There's some evidence of wool tunics as well. So they may have been layered. Um, that evidence is particularly from Hedebu. Um, but most of the things that are under the apron or the, um, the brooches it, are linen. And the evidence, as you can see from this picture, that's a little scrap of fabric that was preserved by the apron brooch. Um, this picture happens to be pleated linen, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But this is, this is the textile evidence we have of dresses. It's that tiny scrap of fabric. So when you're getting like really concerned about how am I patterning my tunic or how am I dealing with my neckline or whatever, 
that's what we're talking about as evidence, that little wadge of fabric. So relax a little, it's gonna be fine. <laughs> Um, we also sometimes get evidence, primarily it's from, from these brooches because they're, they're big, you know, and they're concave. There's room for stuff to be wedged under there. But we also sometimes get evidence from um, wrist areas, from hip areas in particular. And those are from things like knives that are hanging down, scissors that are hanging down. There's one where there's a, a little bit of a wrist bit that's got the impression of a bracelet on it. It doesn't have the bracelet anymore, or at least it's not, it wasn't conserved with the bracelet. So it might have been with it originally, but when they, um, the whoever went through that grave, they separated them. But um, mostly it's brooches that have preserved this stuff. So I basically broken this down into what things am I concerned about when I'm designing an underdress? And those are things like, what does my neckline look like? What do my sleeves look like? How long is it going to be? What's the general shape of it going to be? Things like that. So for necklines, I mean, there's not a lot of this preserved, but what is preserved seems to indicate um, a high likelihood of keyhole necklines. And the reason for that is um, particularly in Birka, there's a lot of graves that have a little small brooch up at the neck, like this little guy, right? A little, in particular, little round brooches. And in several of these brooches, there are pieces of linen that, have a little rolled hem that hit each other and then have a little rolled hem that goes down the side and there'll be like two pieces that meet up in the middle of that brooch which sure seems like a keyhole neckline I mean I'm not sure what else it would be but it's it's this like this little portion right here is what's preserved by that brooch there are also a lot of graves that just have the brooches the little round brooches up at the neck so you can sort of infer that even if those don't have fabric anymore because the there are a bunch of brooches that do have fabric you can infer that probably those little brooches used to have fabric um so fair amount of these i'm not going to go through all of these there's a bunch of grace from birka and there's also a handful from hey to be um there are also a couple of um finds that indicate the presence of a big wide neckline or a lower neckline um but those are primarily from hey to be and there's just a couple. There's one that, uh, or these two that have a, what's interpreted as a rounded neckline. Um, and I'll show you reconstruction of that one in a little bit. Um, there's one that uh, is maybe a V-neck. And then if you look at um, the later period tunics, which I'll show you patterns for in a minute, like um, uh, Mosland and Craigland and Skjaldum. Skjaldum has a, a V-neck, um, but you'll see kind of necklines in this family. But the truth is there are no preserved underdresses. <laughs> There's not anything that's complete where you could say, oh, 100%, that's a, this kind of neckline. So it seems like probably there's a lot of keyhole necklines, which makes sense because there's a lot of keyhole necklines later. Um, and it's a really convenient neckline because you can put your head through it, it's fine. Um, and then have a cute little brooch, which is super, super decorative and adorable. Um, by the way, there's a lot of graves at Birka. A lot of those graves do not have anything in this area at all. So all of those graves, no idea what was going on up here. The only graves that we can say anything about are the ones that had the brooches. So if you don't have a brooch, who knows? Make it what you want. It's fine. Sleeves, who the heck knows? There's a little bit of stuff here and there. Yeah, I've referenced a grave called Pskov here, which I did not include in our bibliography. That is not Scandinavia. You see Pskov referenced a fair amount. It's in modern day um, Latvia, I believe. And it's a weird little town. Um, it's not on any huge trade routes or anything. Like you kind of have to make an effort in the Viking age to go to Pskov. It's, it's not on its way. It's not really on your way to anywhere. But it's unique in that it is the only Viking age grave site that contains both turtle brooches and temple rings. Otherwise, the, those two are not, they're, they're culturally exclusive uh, based on graves, right? Either you've got turtle brooches and you're Scandinavia, or you've got temple rings and you're Slavic. Um, they're really not the same, um, unless you want to recreate Pskov, in which case, feel free, because there is a whole bunch of textile evidence at Pskov that's really interesting. 
but it's not really Scandinavia. So we're not really going to talk about it. Um, but it does have the bottom of a sleeve and it's got a silk cuff, which is very interesting. It's a pleated dress as well. It's kind of, there's some weird stuff about that find, but um, Birka has several where there was a knife or a uh, scissors or something at the waist that preserved a little bit of sleeve. Um, there's some evidence there for pleated sleeves, which we'll get to pleats in a second. Um, but again, that's indicating that your sleeves were longer because your arm is resting at your hip. You can't see my arm, but it's resting at my hip. And uh, you know that's where your wrist is. And so if there's linen at your hip over the wool of your apron dress, then it would be a sleeve. Um, Kaoping's got a little bit, um, Hedeby has an actual sleeve that's largely preserved. It's wool, so it's probably not an underdress. It's probably an, an overlayer that is not an apron dress. So this is the recon this picture is the reconstruction of that sleeve from Hedeby. So it's a little weird looking. It's not your straight rectangular construction like we think for uh, Viking Age patterning. That garment is got a fitted arm side. I'll show you a picture of that in a minute, but sleeves are a little, they're a little harder to figure out. Um, so then you have to say, all right, well, I need to wear it. So what are the usability needs that I have for a sleeve? Um, I don't want to get sunburned, so I want it to be long. I get sunburned really easily, so I want my sleeves to be long. I want them to be lightweight for myself because it's hot. Um, but uh, I'll stay much cooler in a lightweight, long-sleeved dress than I will in a short sleeve dress because I'm not going to get the sun reaction. Um, I want to be able to wash dishes. I can't do that easily in these sleeves. They're too snug. Or I want to, you know, wash my hands. So maybe that's an argument for having a slightly wider sleeve. I don't know. You got to, you have to sort of make your own argument for that because there's not a ton of evidence for sleeves. There's these few little things, but. Color. Most of these linen fragments are undyed, which makes sense. Linen doesn't take uh, natural dyes very well. Um, you can dye it with synthetic dyes nowadays, but natural dyes, it doesn't. It doesn't um, absorb the color very well, even if you mordant it. And so, you know, you're going to dye it. It's going to be fine. It's not going to be great, you know, like a wool would take dye, but it's going to be fine. And then you're going to sweat on it, or you're going to wear it in the sun, or you're going to wash it, and all of that dye is going to come out. And so, what's the point? Like, it's just a waste of it's a waste of uh, of materials. So, that is supported by the fact that most of these scraps are white. There are a few exceptions to that, which are very interesting. I don't have. There's an Icelandic grave that has a uh, blue linen underdress that I don't have referenced. I'm sorry about that. I couldn't find it last night. <laughs> um, but there is some evidence for blue. The indigotin, which is the um, primary chemical in woad and indigo dyes, it actually will absorb fairly well into linen um, and will stick around longer than other kinds of dyes will. So you definitely potentially could have a blue linen underdress. Um, and there are a few um, fragments that that back that up. Um, there's a red one in Birka. There's a lot of debate as to whether it was dyed red or if it was turned red as the iron in the turtle brooch leached out. I, I saw very convincing arguments in both directions. So that one you just sort of have to, like if you want a red dress, you can use that as evidence. And if you don't care, then don't. Um, Haidabu is very interesting in that there are a couple of linen fragments that are cross, they're woven with different colors and it's blue and white in one case and blue and red in another. Um, they're very small little checks. And so it's like, I can't remember, it's like 10, 10 warps of blue and then one of white or something like that. I mean, it's really small, the scale of it. So if you've got like a big window pane plaid or something that, like I have a dress that's like that. And I was so excited to find that fabric. So I was like, oh, it's checkers, just like it hated me. Mm, no, the scale of it is way off. Um, so they're really small little, little checkers, but that's super interesting, right? Cause they dyed that fabric blue, that yarn before they wove it. And they didn't dye the fabric, they dyed the yarn. So that's a very interesting find. Um, and then of course, red and blue, that's adorable. So that'd be super cute. I have never found, I've not yet found any linen in these colorways that are in this scale. And I'm looking all the time. I found a blue and white one that was really close recently. And I don't remember if I bought it or not. 
I know I thought about it. But yeah, so underdresses, primarily white. That's just sort of the easiest default. Um, and it provides a nice contrast for a colored other garment anyway. But if you really want a colored under tunic, blue is a real good bet. Red is an okay bet. And again, red would probably be matter, which is very likely also imported. Scandinavia is not a great place for growing things. Like the very bottom of Norway and Sweden, you can grow things. Um, Denmark is okay for growing things. I mean, there's a reason why the Gauls invaded Rome. Like they didn't want to live in Denmark either. It's not a great place for agriculture. It's cold there. There's not good soil. Um, Make it as long as you want to make it. I don't know how long it is. These are some carvings. They look longish. They're probably long. There's a, an Anglo-Saxon era runestone that shows a woman riding a horse where the garment is clearly knee, knee length. It's a, you know, a boxy little tunic. Um, I've seen a lot of people argue that if you're walking around in the snow, you don't want a long dress because it'll wick moisture up. I don't know. I don't walk around in the snow in my dresses very often, so I don't know about that. But um, most tapestries where, or uh, figurines or like the gold gubber, which are these little um, pressed metal squares that show figures, typically the women look like their garments are ankle-ish length. That seems to be a pretty good average. Um, so that's what I typically aim for is the top of my foot or the ankle. But again, do what you want. If it's winter and you're walking around in the snow, make a shorter one. No one can tell you it's wrong, right? <laughs> you wanna layer your tunics. I don't actually like apron dresses much as I enjoy my Viking age Norwegian impression. I don't, I don't wear apron dresses very much. They get on my nerves and I find them bothersome. So I really do like a layered tunic situation. And there's some evidence of that, not a ton, but there's some. Um, birka has got one that's got, um, both the layers are linen, one is plain and one is pleated. Um, hedebu has got some evidence of tunics that are wool. Probably that's not something that you would wanna wear next to your skin. I don't think it's a particularly nice wool. It would be itchy, I don't know. You'd probably wear a linen tunic under that. That's a, you know, an inference. There's not evidence of that necessarily. Um, so yeah, there's, if you squint, there's some evidence for wearing layered tunics. Um, so sure, do that. Um, if you're gonna do that, probably the safest logical bet would be linen and wool. Although if you live in a really warm climate, cause obviously, you know, if you live in New Mexico, you're not reenacting the climate and environment of 10th century Norway. Um, if you really feel a compelling need to layer your linen tunics, it's probably fine. It's fine. Just do that. Um, oh, here's the here's the hey to be fragment, by the way. If I pronounce that differently every time I say it, it's because I don't actually know how you say it correctly. You'll see hey to be, and you'll see this spelling, hey to be. One's German and one's Dutch, or uh, Danish. It, that's the only, they're the same place. It just depends on what language you're speaking. Um, so this fragment's pretty interesting. It's not a full garment, but there's chunks of the same garment. There's a chunk that's probably a sleeve. There's a chunk that's probably from the torso. There's a chunk that shows the waistline. There's a chunk that's maybe a hem. And so when you put them all together, you can make sort of a convincing shape for what this might be. Now, I think this is um, a little bit later. I think this is 10th century. And so you can see the shaped armpit, which is not, I think we always think, oh, the Viking age will do with rectangular construction. It'll be easy and great, which is probably very logical. There's some evidence that that wasn't the case, at least here um, in this find, there is a shaped arm sign. So if you want to do a shaped arm sign, have it be a little bit more fitted, then you should do that. And you can use this as your evidence. And if you don't want to, then don't because that's probably also fine. There's just not specific evidence of armpits in other garments. Um, but this garment is really interesting. If you combine sort of, you know, it's like five different fragments together. You've got wool, you've got a wide neckline, you've 
or potentially a V-shaped neckline. Um, you've got shoulder seams. So it's not just like one thing that goes across, like there's an actual seam on the shoulder that's a little bit shaped. Um, there's a curved arm side, fitted sleeve. There's evidence of gores in this one, although it's unclear whether those gores are in the front or on the sides, because they're, it's not real clear what these fragments, like where they always are on the garment. Um, but that's cool. It means maybe you had a squish, swishier skirt than you would necessarily get from a, a kind of rectangular construction with narrower gores. Um, and maybe there was a waist seam. I don't know. Maybe there was a seam going down the front. Also no idea, but isn't that interesting? Because of course, if there is a waist seam or a seam going down the front, that indicates that maybe this was a little bit more tailored um, than just a box. So those are all facts that you could then make a story to go with how you felt like kind of putting this garment together. And it would be a perfectly fine story, even compared to someone else who had a different story based on the same evidence. <laughs> oh, the Viking Age. Uh, one note on pleated cirques. So these are fun. Um, and what I mean by pleated is that the, the bit that's in the brooch isn't just a flat piece of linen, like it's in regular little pleats and they're tiny pleats, you guys. These are not like giant inch wide pleats. These are like two centimeters, four centimeters, like they're little tiny pleats. Um, and I've seen a bunch of different reconstructions of these where people are basically, you know how you would do like a smocked um, apron, like for the 14th century or the 15th century. Um, or, a, you know, a, like cartridge, I mean, it's basically cartridge pleating, right, where you would take a, um, a thread and kind of go in and out and then pull it all together. And there's some evidence of this when we get to apron dresses as well. It's a, I mean, it's a little weird. I don't know why you would do it. Um, and I've seen a lot of reconstructions where the maintenance of a pleated cirque, the way that it's being done by modern reenactors would just be miserable because you'd have to like replete it every time and then you'd wash it and it would all fall out. And why would you want something that's that hard to maintain on an underdress that you're gonna wash? I, I don't know. I'm not a big fan of these, um, but they're certainly very interesting. Birka, several piece, several graves that have evidence of this. Um, Hadeby has some, but it's only probably a cirque. It's a little unclear. Um, what's interesting is that in all of the graves and all of Scandinavia, Really, it's only Birka, with this one exception from Hadeby. But really, it's only Birka that's got evidence of pleated linen. And it's got a lot of evidence of it. Um, and one sort of interpretation of that is because Birka was a trade hub, that maybe these were being imported from Kiev. Because they imported a lot of stuff from Kiev. And you don't see those pleated cirques anywhere else. So there's none in Norway. There's none in Iceland. They're just here in Birka. So who knows? The other really great piece of evidence for a pleated cirque is, of course, Skov. We're not going to talk about Skov because that's not Scandinavia for our purposes. Do you have any, are there any questions? Anyone? We okay? Okay. Um, now, what follows is just some patterns that you can use. These are all post Viking age. Some of them are right on the edge, like Craigland is right on the edge. It depends on sort of who you ask about the dates of the um, the Viking Age. It, uh, it looks like there's a question in the in the chat. Uh, oh, yes. it says, uh, would you know if Ahmad Ibn Fadlan ever described any Scandinavian women he observed and their appearance in his writings? Not that I have ever come across. That doesn't mean it's not the case because I have not read Ibn Fahlan. Oh, but and I have. Somebody put an answer in the, for them in the, in the chat as well. I guess there is something. Yeah. <laughs> okay. describes the, the breast boxes, the turtle brooches. And okay. their Thank you. Their <laughs> yeah. But, that's yeah, but we it. know they had those. <laughs> right. But he's the only person in period to describe them. Right. And they were the Which breast is... boxes. Cause you know, from his standpoint, what the hell are those? <laughs> right. You got snacks in there. Like what's happening? They're the weirdest thing. I don't know who thought that that would be a cultural moment but i totally have snacks in mine i don't know about you but <laughs> i wish i could figure out like i hang uh, bags from mine and i keep chapstick in them because <laughs> i don't want giant ones but i could totally make a snack bag and justify that there's a great find i think it's 
I think it's in Denmark and it's considered a sorceress and she's got a bag that hangs and they found like henbane in it and they found some other herbs and basically it was her magic bag. That's a, that's off topic. I like that grave. That's pretty cool though. So yeah, snack bags. <laughs> that sounds like a euphemism for something else entirely. I'm gonna, I'm gonna move on from that. Um, okay, so these are just a handful of, of drawings of tunics that you could maybe use to be references for under tunics because it's not like we really have stuff. There's Mosland, Denmark. A lot of these are Denmark. Um, Skeldum is Norway. And Skeldum, the dating on Skeldum is a little bit wacky. Um, and the other thing that's interesting about Skeldum is like there are some full garments from Skeldum. It's great. They're not women's garments that I, I don't believe. I think they're men's garments, but still they're like, there's a lot of stuff there. But um, there's been some scholarship fairly recently, like in the last handful of years, um, that makes some correlations between the way that um, those garments are decorated and the way that Sami clothing is decorated. And so the Sami are the indigenous tribe kind of in the north of Scandinavia, and they're still there. Um, and their, cult their sort of ornament style and, and textiles and stuff haven't changed a ton in like a thousand years. So the sort of the neckline, there's a, a, a V-neck that's got some layered um, textiles on it. And there's a, a, another tunic that I think it's got a little collar and it's got like a little square placket or whatever. Those textiles, I guess, are very reminiscent of um, Sami textiles. And so there's some argument that that's, this is, was not a Norwegian, the way that we would think of like a Viking, um, that this may have been uh, either an indigenous grave or someone who is adopting the clothing of the indigenous tribes. I don't know, that's not for me to say, but I think that's interesting. And so when you have a, some of the ornamentation styles from this grave that aren't found elsewhere, then that's something to sort of think about when you're making choices. And I mean, if you wanna say, well, this is based on the Skjaldum tunic and I'm gonna wear it as a Norwegian um, uh, representation, I mean, I can't tell you not to do that. Nobody can. It's from Norway. <laughs> you know, it's a grave that you could point to. But um, if you're interested in sort of expanding into the context of that grave a little bit, I think those are some interesting questions to ask. Um, Duchess Cecilia, I wanted yeah. to pop in and let you know we're at our 10 minute mark. So I just wanted to no. get you on that. Oh, crap. Yeah, I, know. I know. I wish this was a two hour class because I'm. Oh, like, I'm so sorry. I haven't taught this before. <laughs> I did not think that this would take me. Like, I'm going to, I'm almost done. Oh, you can look at this later. I'll show you. Ah, okay, apron dresses, hang rocks, smockers, smocks, uh, I don't know, whatever. It's all just l other languages for aprons. And the reason is because it's being suspended. Um, there's been a lot of interpretations of this dress. Here are some of them. You can look at that at your leisure. Um, the assumption is that those brooches exist for a reason and the loops that are attached to those brooches exist for a reason. And as such, there must have been a dress that went with it, but we don't know what that dress looked like. There's evidence of the top being turned and stitched. So there's a couple of different finishing techniques that you can find from graves, one fold, two folds, filler threads, some little decorative stitching from Heide B. Um, so that's nice. Um, there's some evidence from uh, a couple of graves in, Norway and Denmark that have pleats uh, that run in between the two brooches, kind of interesting, very small pleats, by the way. Loops, so probably we are not pinning through a strap into our dress where there's a loop on the top of the dress and a loop that comes across the shoulder and the brooches are suspended between those loops and there'll be like a, you know, a gap. Um, almost all the loops are linen and there's a lot of them, particularly in Birka, like a lot of loops and not just one top and one bottom. There's like multiple loops. There's sometimes there's three or four sets of loops in the same brooch. Who knows what's happening there? Um, there's a few silk ones, a few wool ones, a lot of linen ones, undyed linen ones. Um, I'll post this for you so you can look at all of this detail. Basically, this is talking about how there's multiple loops. The interpretation for that is, I don't know, are we wearing more than one apron dress? Because it's cold or something, I don't know. Um, or do we have a hanging apron? That's become a real popular style in the essay in the last uh, five years or so, I think. 
Um, I've seen people interpret it as a cape. Sure. Um, my favorite is that you're hanging tools from your brooch on loops. And I have several like that where I have a, a fabric loop that hangs my, my scissors or my ear spoon or whatever. And I love how it looks and it functions really well. So that might be the deal with loops. Shape, my God, you guys, there's just not anything except this piece from Hey to Be. <laughs> like, it's, it's literally just this weird shape. It probably comes from here to about the waist. There's some evidence of felting on the waist and there's a dart for shaping. It's a super tiny dart. Like I use a big, biggish dart. Like I think I use um, like a half inch dart at its deepest. It's super too big. Like this dart is tiny. Um, and it's got a braid that goes from the, the uh, assumed top all the way down uh, the top of that dart. Is it for decoration? Is it for wear? Who knows these things, but it's super cute. And it seems like that dart goes to the outside of the garment, which is very interesting. So is it a decorative element? It's so small. Is it even for fitting? I don't know, but the cirque or the, this fragment, one side is straight and one side flares out. So that would also provide a little bit of shaping. It's got a finished top. It's fascinating. What it's totally fabric was that, that fragment? What? What fabric was that? Well, Okay. It's wool and it's from the harbor. It's not from the graveyards in Haiti. It's the, it's from the harbor. And it was basically like someone's thrown away garbage thing and they used it um, to caulk a ship. And so it's covered in tar and stuff and that's what preserved it. But it's not in situ. So it's not on a body. So you have to sort of figure out like where on the body would that fit? And there's a finished top. So we know that it was at the top. And the implication is, you know, that it would have had brooches. We don't know if that fragment is from the front or the back. So it might have had two darts on the back. It might have had a dart darts in the front. Who knows? I put mine in the back because that's where I need fitting for my body shape. I just want to let you know it's we've got a our, we're at our five minute mark now. So oh I, my gosh, you guys, I'm so sorry. I know. I think we should like schedule another class like this next week or something so we can. Well, now I know better. <laughs> I should not try to fit all this in an hour. I apologize, you guys. I it's thought good, I would be able really to get through this though. faster. Um, let me see. One last thing, decoration. There is not a lot of evidence for this, you guys. Little silk band at the top, maybe. Maybe a little braid. Maybe a, like a couple of strings. Um, not, not evidence for giant panels. Like little, little strips. Little strips. There's one that's got tablet weaving, maybe two, I can't remember. I think it's cost strip that has tablet weaving. Little, little, little ornamentation or lots of no ornamentation. So just make a tube out of wool, put some brooches on it. You don't need to make it fancier than that. Have some cool fabric, diamond twill, broken twill, do something cool, but you don't have to slap trim on, on everything. I know you want to, I also want to. <laughs> But maybe don't do it every time. A little bit of braid. Um, for example, you can see this is just a little bit of braid that I stitched to the top. Simple, simple, simple. And then wear some jewelry and it's fine. Um, I don't know, you can look at this later. That's from Oseberg. It's very pretty applied silk. Um, I didn't mention Oseberg because there's almost no textiles from the body. There's loads of textiles but they're like tapestries and pillows. And there's like 50 different tablet weaving designs from Osberg, but they're not on the body, just super aggravating. And there's no turtle brooches in that grave either. So she may not have even been wearing an apron dress, even though that's a ubiquitous garment in the ninth century. I don't know. Where's shawl? Shawls look cool. <laughs> I'm sorry, you guys. <laughs> Wear something on your head. It's fun. It's a little Dublin cap. There's some, oh, can I just point out this gen color in the corner here with this little, this cute little headscarf, which is my favorite right now. Mine's too long. How adorable is that? That's from Dublin, just so you know. All right, I guess we're out of time. I'm sorry. Hopefully you now know a lot about Cirques. That was terrible time management on my part. Here's some reconstructions from Hey to B. There's Kostrup, there's Bagnus. That's from Norway. Here's a reconstruction of um, Oseberg by a woman named Astrid Breed, who's a, a living history, experimental archeologist, hobbyist kind of person in 
Europe somewhere. I love this dress, it's so pretty. Look, narrow little bands, right though? Narrow bands, it's adorable. Here's some more of her stuff. Simple, good natural dye colors. You see this one in the middle, the yellow one, it's just got a little bit of yarn along the bottom. It's nothing fancy at all, but it's really striking and pretty. It's a beautiful yellow, I love that color. I put this one on, look at this hat that she's wearing. It is the cutest hat on earth. It is not Scandinavian, it is Phrygian, but there's a whole bunch of graves that have these little hats. Look at this, how adorable, right? Intact hats, they've got embroidery on them. They're so cute. You wanna look up Alsum, A-A-L-S-U-M, near the town of Groningen. There's like six graves that have different hats, little pillbox hats. There's a pillbox hat that's got like a little brim on it that's super sweet. I haven't made one of those yet. Anyway, thank you for coming to my class where you learned about cirques and nothing else. <laughs> Sorry, there's some, there's some further reading. Oh, I'm gonna put I'm gonna put this link in the chat, aren't I? I'm gonna put this link in the chat. Yes. Unfortunately, the chat's going to be going away here in a minute. <laughs> so I'm so right. sorry. Go to that link real quick, and then you can look at graves. <laughs> you, you could put the link on the on the group on the Facebook group. I am going to do right. that. I will do that here in a minute before I forget. I'll go do it right now. Hopefully it'll Great. work. Awesome. I think I've set the permissions correctly. Yeah, it did. I got it up. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> brilliant. I my uh, tools. Yes. <laughs> I do love a tool. I'm still waiting for my little knife. I did a trade for it and he's being oh, a slow poke. That's going to be fantastic. My Knives are good. All right. Well, Not like I need it right now. Thank you so much, Dr. Dr. Cecilia. That was amazing. I seriously, I want to do like another class that's like just on this for like two well, hours or something. Maybe we could just do a Facebook or a, um, a Zoom <laughs> meeting or something just for this maybe. for a couple hours. So no, well, you're thank you all for being time. my guinea pigs. And now I know, <laughs> now I know better than to try to do this in an hour. You're good. I'm going to stop the recording now. And thank you everybody.